In our previous video, we were looking at different types of goods, public goods, private goods, and we we're looking at their different definitions. What we want to look at now is a good that is a private good that we choose to treat as a public good. So this is what we call a quasi public good. It is a private good we choose to treat as public. So we need to go back then to the definition. So private good was rival and excludable and a public good is non-rival and non-excludable. So really what we're coming down to is this idea of excludable versus non-excludable. So it's a good or service that we could exclude the non-payer. So you don't pay for it, you don't get it. But instead, we're going to treat as public, that is, we are not going to exclude the non-payer. And in these cases, we treat them like public. And remember, the solution to public goods was to have everyone pay for them so that we couldn't have the free rider problem where only a small handful of people pay, everyone else enjoys and doesn't pay, and so we don't have enough produce because production is based on those who are willing to pay. So quasi-public goods are private goods we're going to treat as public, meaning we're not going to exclude people, and we're going to pay for it with our taxes to avoid that free rider problem. So why would we take a private good and treat it as public? Well, there are three reasons why you would take a private good and treat it as public. So the three reasons why quasi-public goods exist. The first is sometimes it is too expensive to obtain payment for goods. So for example, roads. We could treat roads like a private good. Let's exclude the non-payer, right? And uh, just recently, so this is November 2020, Alberta's been talking about more toll roads, right? So toll roads, only the user pays for it. Well, we could have toll roads. Other countries have toll roads. Uh, the U.S. has a lot of them. So here we could exclude the non-payer, treat it as a private good. You don't pay the toll, you don't use the road. Well, why might we choose not to do toll roads and instead treat roads as a public good? Well, what if we made all of Red Deer toll roads? So you pull out of your garage, and the street you're on, you got to pay a toll. And every time you turn a corner onto a different street, you pay a toll. Well, if we had to have toll booths every time you went onto a different street, we would all work collecting tolls. We'd all work in a toll booth. So there, the cost to obtain payment for the use of the good, so having a toll booth on every road in the entire town, is too cost prohibitive, too expensive. So what's an easier way to help pay for the roads? Well, instead of paying a penny every time you turn on a different road, you just pay taxes to the city and the city builds the roads. So it's a private good, we could exclude the non-payer, but we choose not to because it's just too expensive to have people pay every time they use the product. The second reason we would have a quasi-public good is because competition is inefficient or wasteful. All right, so let's suppose you live in a bigger city, uh, Edmonton, Calgary, and we're looking at the C train or the LRT. Okay, so we're looking at mass transit. Maybe even in Red Deer, we could look at the bus system. Why don't we open this up to competition? So how about in Red Deer, instead of having one city bus system, we open it up to competition and now there's five different companies that provide bus service in Red Deer. Or in Edmonton and Calgary, what if we have five different companies that operate like the C-Train or the LRT? Well, what would that mean? That would mean that in Edmonton and Calgary, you have one track for the C-Train or the LRT and then one for the competition and one for the next competition, all side by side. In Red Deer, our, we'd have one bus 
for the first company, another bus for the second company, all go on the same routes. Well, here, competition is inefficient. It doesn't make sense to have multiple companies all driving the same bus route or going on uh, tracks right next to each other. It's wasteful, right? So instead, what we do is we pay for the service uh, with our taxes, okay? So we don't exclude people. We all pay and chip in. And that way we have one company provide the most efficient process. In most cities, Red Deer included, the bus system or um, the public transportation system, it's actually a mix of a public and private good. So when you look at how much you pay for a trip on the bus or the LRT, half of the price that you're paying in the ticket um, or for your access card, you're paying half of the cost and then the other half is being covered by taxes. So we're treating it as a bit of a public private good. So these are quasi public goods. They could be completely private. We're going to treat them as public or at least partially as public. The third reason for a quasi public good is because the good itself has a greater benefit to the population, to the society as a whole. So there's some kind of positive externality. There is a benefit to people who are not the buyers or the sellers. In a private good, in the market for a private good, the price and quantity only consider the benefit or value to the customer, the benefit, the cost to the business. It is based only on the impact to the buyer and the seller. But sometimes we have goods that benefit greater society. So they benefit people who are not in that demand or supply curve. And we want that taken into consideration. So the problem with this price and this quantity is it's based only on the impact to the buyer and the seller. If there is a greater benefit to society, we would like this quantity to be higher. Okay, we'd like this price to be lower so that more people can have access to these goods and services because it has a greater benefit for everyone. So these are things like education and healthcare. So when you pay for going to Red Deer College, you pay for your education, we could completely exclude the non-payer and have you, the student, pay the full cost of your education. But because there is a benefit to the rest of society when there are more educated people, creates more jobs, lowers the unemployment rate, reduces the crime rate, raises the standard of living in the town, we collectively benefit, we'd like more people to do it. So what we do is we take a good that would be completely excludable, private good, and treat it somewhat like a public good by having some of it be paid for uh, with taxes. So part of the money Red Deer College receives is base funding, which is a grant from the provincial government that pays for some of the operating costs, and then you pay tuition, which is the other piece. There are other things that we do that uh, have positive externalities, healthcare. Uh, so for example, vaccines. We could exclude the non-payer you don't pay for a flu vaccine or hopefully a COVID vaccine, you don't get it. But we benefit when other people get vaccinated because if you have the flu vaccine or a COVID vaccine, then I'm less likely to get the flu or COVID from you. So I benefit even if I haven't taken the vaccine. And so because there's a benefit to people who are not the ones who made the vaccine, that's a supply curve, not the ones who are getting it, that's the demand curve, there's a benefit to the greater society, we'd like more people to do it. We'd like this quantity to be higher. So how do you do that? Well, to get more people to be willing and able to consume or buy, you make the price go down. So what do we do with vaccines? Do you pay when you go to get a vaccine for the flu? No, we pay for it with our taxes. So these are private goods that would be excludable that we choose not to exclude people from and we prevent that free rider problem 
that comes from making something non-excludable by covering part of it or all of it with our taxes. <laughs>